It's interesting to hear Bush in the last few weeks uh, talking more about PEPFAR than about Iraq. Isn't that interesting? But the President's emergency plan for AIDS relief has real muscle. The budget is six billion US for 2008. The Yanks always do things differently. They have not pulled in with the multilateral programs in the main. They've targeted this to 15 focus countries, the 15 worst affected countries in Africa. They go in and do it themselves, maybe a little bit less of a partnership, more of a let's get our hands dirty, roll up our sleeves and do it. They also provide some funds to the Global Fund, some funds to malaria control. But in fact, when you now combine these two big funds, 3.5 million people are being treated with antiretroviral therapy, combining the two. Now, as it happens, of the 30-odd uh, billion people carrying the virus, 7 million have reached the stage where they require treatment because their CD4 T cell count has fallen to a level where they're now uh, beginning to get symptoms. 3.5 billion being treated. Is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Well, I'll tell you it's half full because 10 years ago that figure was zero. I mean, that is some progress and I did not think that this would be able to be done so quickly. The goal for the G8 and the United Nations is 100% coverage of the AIDS patients by 2010. That goal won't be reached, but it's a heartening progress. One of the things that pleases me most is that probably, and it pains me to say this, but probably the most cost-effective health intervention in the world, more cost-effective even than vaccines, is the prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV by antiretroviral prophylaxis. And so through this program, 13 million or so pregnancies have been surveyed. There were 1 million seropositive mothers who got straightforward, short-term antiretrovirals with a nearly 100% prevention of mother-to-child transmission. Now, Polio is an old disease, and the polio vaccine has been here for 50 years, just like you have, a little bit longer, actually. And the World Health Organization has set itself to eradicate polio, together with the quite wonderful Rotary International, which has provided enormous funding and, above all, enormous volunteer help. But it's become problematic because people are beginning to ask the question, are we spending too much money? on a disease which is now killing and paralyzing very few. The job is almost done. Can we afford to continue to spend $400 million per year, which is what polio eradication is costing? And here are the facts. There are four countries in which polio has never been eradicated. Nigeria, India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And those figures, unfortunately, have not materially lowered in the last two or three years, despite a tremendous amount of effort in Nigeria and India. But the other interesting thing is that once a country has eliminated um, polio, and against all advice, the health authorities frequently stop immunising to save money which of course sets that country up for an importation of the disease from a neighbouring country. And because Nigeria had a sort of a, a lapse in 2003, when the rumour gained currency that the polio vaccine was a Western plot to render Muslim girls sterile, that's what the polio vaccine did. Oh, you don't know all the things that vaccines can do. Um, they stopped immunising, they had a resurgence of... Uh, of polio uh, and, and increased the number of cases and they exported polio to a lot of countries, in fact 27 in all. Those reinfected countries, once you identify the little mini epidemic, you can get on top of fairly quickly by intensive immunisation around the index cases. 
And of the 27 reinfected, six importation countries remain. But even here in this sort of sad story, there are some good news stories. Horn of Africa, most troublesome part of the world probably, well, apart from the Middle East perhaps. Somalia is now polio free. The last case in Somalia was on March the 25th, 2007. So do we continue to spend the 400 million? Margaret Chan, the Director General of the World Health Organization, emphatically says we do. She says finishing the job of polio eradication is our best buy. It's WHO's top operational priority. We must do it. The Stop TB Partnership. Well, again, there's a lot of statistics here. Two billion people infected with TB, 8.8 .8 million new active cases per year, 1.6 million deaths per year. The cornerstone of treatment is directly observable therapy short term. Short term is a bit of a euphemism because it means six months, but it works. It gets about uh, 70 to 80% success rate. And of course, uh, the Stop TB Partnership built on prior work. So altogether, 22 million people have been treated. But we've got problems. Multi-drug resistance, which is resistance to the cheaper first-line drugs, 12 to 15 percent, depending on the country. And very worrying indeed, extreme drug resistance. Resistance to any fluoroquinolone and to at least one of three injectable second-line drugs. Specially targeted pilot programs are addressing drug sensitivity surveillance and what we can do about this terrible problem. Now bear in mind that the tubercle bacillus is controlled by T cells and bear in mind that T lymphocytes is what the HIV loves to attack. So HIV positive people are 50 times more likely to develop active TB in their lifetime than HIV negative people. And the double infection with HIV and TB is truly terrible. Malaria. At least 300 million attacks per year, at least 1 million deaths. Resistance to drugs, mosquito resistance to insecticides, terrible problems. But in amongst the bad news, there's good news. These insecticide impregnated bed nets, that's mainly pyrethroids, because the world mistakenly decided that DDT was a bad thing, which is probably one of the worst decisions the world ever made, they cost five bucks. They remain working for at least two or three years. By themselves, they reduce malaria mortality by more than 50%. And amazingly, all causes mortality by 20% for five bucks. Good investment, huh? And there are new drugs coming online. Another public sector private, partners, uh, public sector, private sector partnership is called Medicines for Malaria. It includes 39 R&D partners, including most of the major drug pharma companies. They've got 11 drugs in clinical trials. Interestingly, five of these are derivatives of artemisinin, which, as you will remember, is the Chinese herbal remedy. Uh, which has been usefully used in China for 2,000 years as a tea, in which the Chinese themselves, in a monumental effort, uh, purified, identified, and uh, structurally analyzed. And uh, now, of course, these derivatives are being made synthetically, and the poor old wormwood trees, of which there are not that many left, are being given a bit of a reprieve. Onchocerciasis control program. I thought I'd show you one that's done and dusted. Onchocerciasis is also known as river blindness. It's a horrible disease. It's carried by a black fly, a picturesquely named Simulium damnosum. I thought that was a pretty good word. Um, its larvae uh, like to swim in rapidly running rivers, so you can Im imagine how effective larva sighting is. But the control program progressively moved from larva sighting alone to spraying plus ivermectin and then finally to the drug ivermectin alone. What's ivermectin? Well, all of you know ivermectin because you give it to your dog every month to prevent heartworm. It's the dog's heartworm pill. 
and it is fantastically effective, not only against uh, this particular parasite, but also other parasites. As a result, river blindness has been virtually eradicated, 600,000 cases have been prevented, 18 million children have been born spared the risk, and 25 million hectares of land have been rendered safe for conservation and resettlement. Now again a filarial worm, this time with an Australian connection, elephantiasis, also known as lymphatic filariasis. Discovered by the Bancrofts, father and son, in the University of Queensland, there are more than a billion people in 80 countries live at risk of, uh, of elephantiasis. This one spread by mosquitoes, there are 120 million people already infected and 40 million significantly disfigured. Two drug companies, GlaxoSmithKline and Merck, have pledged all the drug doses needed for total global eradication. The value of that pledge is a billion dollars. And uh, the drugs are given in combination. Community-wide drug treatment, just once per year. And not only does it get on top of lymphatic filariasis, it also dramatically and persistently reduces hookworm and roundworm infections. And of the billion, about 40% have been reached. Uh, these people set themselves a very ambitious goal. They want to do it in 15 years. And they won't do it in 15 years, because half of those 15 years are up. But they'll do it. Now we come to Gates and the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunisation, started in 2000. This has been a wonderful program. 37 million extra children have received the standard childhood vaccines, but more importantly, the newer vaccines, not so very new as a matter of fact, uh, 176 million children have received any or all of hepatitis B, Haemophilus influenzae B and yellow fever vaccines. Measles deaths have been reduced by 60% and we're aiming for 90% by 2010. Three million deaths prevented, the budget is rising progressively to 1.5 billion per year. Bill Gates kick-started this with uh, three quarters of a billion in 2000, and a second tranche of three quarters of a billion some years later. And on more than one occasion, this founder of Microsoft, whom some people might think Microsoft was his best investment ever, on more than one occasion he has stated publicly, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunisation is my best investment ever. And thus it truly is. Still some challenges, 26 million children each year still not immunised, 2.5 million vaccine preventable deaths each year. And as I said, the budget is now of the order of 1.5 billion, a little more per year. They need an extra 10 to 15 billion over the next 10 years. That is going to partly be fed by funny money, because Politicians can go back on their promises. But if you tie them up legally, such as the International Finance Facility Immunisation, which is a British-based charity which issues bonds, which are then guaranteed by sovereign governments, and you don't have to pay more than a quarter of a percent above the US bank bill rate, um, and that gets paid off over 30 years, and there'll be some other politician that'll be in charge then, you see. So this has been attacked by economists. It's sheer funny money. I mean, it's the same money, but this one the politicians can't get out of. And IFIM plans to raise five and a half billion for the Garvey Alliance over the next period. Note that the donor countries are chiefly European. Even more exciting, from a researcher's point of view, is another funny money concept. It's called advanced market commitments. That's a new mechanism for the development and subsidised purchase of priority vaccines, including ones not yet invented. So how do you get a GlaxoSmithKline or a Merck or a Sanofi Pasteur to invest in a vaccine for bacillary dysentery, which only occurs in the poorest countries? They've got shareholders. Well, you can say to them, I've got this little pot of money here. If you play ball with me and put your best researchers onto searching for that vaccine, I will pledge to you that I will buy 200 million doses at a reasonable price for the next 10 years. And so it's a sort of a push and pull mechanism, if you want. 
Um, and the first cab off the rank is uh, Streptococcus pneumonia, the pneumococcus. It kills 1.6 billion people annually. And the first advanced market commitment is for that disease, with Italy, the United Kingdom and Canada contributing the lion's share. So this form of funny money will fund research, support development, provide funds for a sustainable supply and negotiate what is a reasonable price so that the companies can make at least a little bit of money out of it. Well, I probably haven't got time to go into uh, the uh, carbohydrate protein conjugate vaccines too strongly. Let me just say that this immunologically richly based concept, which depends on collaboration between T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, has created some wonderful vaccines against meningitis. Your kids and grandkids are getting these, the Hib, the um, meningococcus C, and the pneumococcus. And um, we would like that to be spread to the developing countries. Uh, one exciting sub-aspect of this is the work that's been done in conjunction between Gates and the World Health Organization on epide epidemic meningitis in Africa, which happens to be a strain of uh, Neisseria meningitis that we don't get. So there's been no interest in the richer countries making such a vaccine. It's Neisseria meningitis sera group A, and this initiative for the first time involves research and development by a third world manufacturer. So it's actually a first. It's actually saying to an India, you've got to be our partner. You've got to come and use your brilliant brains uh, to help the world. And the Serum Institute of India was chosen in association with two contract research organisations for technology transfer. And this project is well and truly on track. And just as we were wondering who would, who would fund the Phase 2B studies, along comes a new foundation, the Dell Foundation, and says, I'll fund that. And in fact, I'll make a whole country the laboratory. I'll make the whole of Burkina Faso a laboratory to see if this vaccine works. And all 1 to 29-year-olds in Burkina Faso will be getting this vaccine in 2009. It's a small country, of course, uh, and we'll see what happens. But I have to confess to you, if that works, and I confidently expect it will, we'll still need $400 million to immunise 350 million people in 20 other countries. So that's work to be done. Progress with diarrheal disease vaccines has been slower. There are two rotavirus vaccines licensed, but they're expensive. Hope for a cheaper product from the virus's Australian discoverers, which is, of course, Ruth Bishop, um, Ian Holmes, uh, Julie Bynes, and Graham Barnes. Uh, great hope that they might come up with a much cheaper vaccine. Good vaccines against cholera and typhoid exist, but guess who uses them? We do, the travellers. No country has yet deployed cholera or typhoid vaccines on a population-wide basis. And there's uh, work on bacillary dysentery and the traveller's diarrhoea and trotoxigenic E. coli, but clinical trials are lagging. Now, you all know about the vaccines which prevent the viral causes of cancer. The hepatitis B we've had for a while, now being widely used through Gavi. Little bit of progress towards a hepatitis C vaccine and the brilliant uh, work by Ian Fraser in Queensland on the human papillomavirus vaccine, hugely successful. That covers 70% of the cancer-causing serotypes. Second generation vaccines will cover 90 to 95% and they will have to be included. Sadly, the other brilliant Australian discovery, namely Helicobacter pylori as the cause of peptic ulcer and gastric cancer, has not yet produced a vaccine. And in fact, there's relatively little work going on on a Helicobacter pylori vaccine, which is sad because there are approximately a million gastric cancer deaths in the world each year. Now, what about the big three? Let's finish with the big three. Progress with malaria. The big three, of course, are malaria, 
tuberculosis and HIV AIDS. Progress with malaria. GlaxoSmithKline in conjunction with the US Department of Defense, mainly the Walter Reed uh, Army Institute of Research, have come up with a vaccine that is safe and immunogenic in children and infants. It's been in phase two trials in uh, Mozambique chiefly. It can be given at the same time as your diphtheria pertussis tetanus, which has great logistic advantages, the so-called DPT platform. Uh, there's still a problem with the percent efficacy, which is about 65%, you wish it were higher, and the duration of protection, which is currently measured in months rather than years, but still, it's a ray of light in what's been a very dark area. We need to add blood stage antigens to that in due course of time. And <coughs> there's even a sportsman by the name of Steve Hoffman, who thinks he's going to be able to dissect out enough mosquito salivary glands to make a vaccine of living irradiated sporozoites, because that's been shown to be 90% effective in human volunteers. Tuberculosis, the Gates Foundation has given a very generous grant to the AIRAS Tuberculosis Vaccine Foundation, 200 million bucks, run by Jerry Sadoff, ex Merck, and that includes new BCG strains with genes for selected soluble antigens put into them, as well as novel recombinant proteins, novel adjuvants, various regimens called prime boost, and of the 20 or so antigens that are in this mix, four that happen to be called ESAT6, AG85B, TB10.4 and HSP90 look to be the most promising. Jerry is determined to have two phase three trials by late 2010 and the six phase one studies have started or are about to start. HIV AIDS is the laggard. I wish I could give you some good news here, but I can't. But I can tell you that the world effort in AIDS vaccine research is now $800 million a year. So you can't say the world isn't spending enough in the research for an AIDS vaccine. And there's strong attempts to achieve coordination and collaboration. Gates has got what they call CAVD, the Collaboration for AIDS Vaccine Discovery. The NIH, intramural and extramural, has a large collaborative effort. The International AIDS Vaccine Initiative is a smaller coordinating body based in New York. The Europeans are working hard and even South Africa has a collaborative AIDS vaccine initiative of some note. Quite recently, I had the honour of chairing the first meeting of GAHAVE, the Global HIV AIDS Vaccine Enterprise. They took a long time to find their chief executive because it's such a sort of a noble concept that all of the AIDS vaccine workers in the world should be working together, one big happy family. And what this <coughs> enterprise is about is communication, knowledge management, and policy development. <coughs> the distinguished um, American, uh, Canadian scientist and um, health administrator, Alan Bernstein, has finally emerged as the head of Gahave, and he asked me to chair a sad meeting a post-mortem on the failed Merck drug, drug on the 21st of September 2007. Uh, Merck had to stop one of only two uh, efficacy trials uh, because bluntly uh, the thing didn't prevent infection or lower the set point, it was just no good. There's 30 candidates in early clinical trials but there's only one remaining candidate in eff efficacy trials, the Sanofi Pasteur vaccine. Uh, as far as the AIDS vaccine is concerned, it really is back to the drawing board. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a rather long romp through a dozen or so quite significant programs. And the main message I wanted to leave with you is that it's not all doom and gloom. Interesting things are happening. The world is recognising its responsibilities. A lot of these diseases are able to be conquered and in time will be. And yes, it'll be slower than 
I might have hoped, and yes, there'll be setbacks like this failed Merck, uh, AIDS vaccine trials. And even Gates's money itself won't be enough. But I am not discouraged, and I'm very proud of the fact that your foundation, right here at this very university, is supporting a lot of enterprising things in the international health field. I wish you well. I'm so delighted to have been able to be with you. Thank you. Gus, thank you very much. Very few people could have taken us through, as you described it, a romp through these global challenges and have left us so inspired to help try to contribute to solving some of them. But I'd ask you to join me in thanking Sir Gus again for challenging us and, in, and at the same time inspiring us tonight to help contribute to solving some of these problems. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you.